Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is William, and uh, this is our last session, isn't it? Yeah. The whole session. How are you all feeling? A bit exhausted? Yeah, you have that look about you, I have to say. I've just come in. I don't really have a day job. I work for the BBC, so I come in fresh. But you all kind of go, what's next? Uh, and next is, you know, it's, it's the finale. Look at them. They're so keen to, to bring you the finale. We're going to have a conversation on reconciliation, navigating the path to peace. And there are many different paths to peace and many different practitioners, many different specialisms. We, this room, more than any other, knows that. And we need all the skills, all the specialisms um, to, to really make peace building work. Um, I work in the media, uh, and I usually... Uh, say to my colleagues when we go to the studio, let us go again and do battle against the forces of irrationality um, in a phone-in show. Because in, in phone-in shows, you, you kind of encounter the public uh, rather directly. And there, there, is a, there is a sense out there that this peace process has been disastrously um, wrong-footed and hasn't gotten us anywhere. And which is an astonishing misunderstanding of this peace process, of course because it is probably the most successful in the world. And if you think this is bad, you ought to look at the rest of them. Uh, we, we brought on a uh, professor of international law the other day from Oxford, and his team had researched 1,000 peace agreements and processes since 1945. And he was prepared to put Northern Ireland in the top three in all of those. And that is due to the enormous hard work uh, of many, many often unacknowledged people across our society and people from around the world who have brought their skills and their experience and their wisdom uh, to us. And I think one of the ways in which we have seen that is in, those, in these hiatus moments when we don't even have a government. You know, we, we have no government for three years, we have no government for 18 months, we're 40% of the time without a government here, and yet we don't go back to war. Now, that in itself, I think, is the greatest evidence of a peace process that is working. It doesn't mean the politics is working. It means the peace process is working. Peace process doesn't give you good governance. That's for the voters to decide. And what they put in place, that can decide the policies. But we have a fantastically optimistic place, in my judgment, in terms of our peace process here. I've given my life to here. I could go like, like you could, go live somewhere else. I love living here. And I like to curate my experience of this society so that I don't surround myself with, in bubbles of negativity and, and, and toxins of misinformation. I like where I live. It's a beautiful place, and I'm incredibly grateful to those who have gone before me in this society who have helped to build this place for us. So some of you are in the room, and I'm really grateful to you personally. We're going to develop some of those themes in terms of how we take it further on the pathway of peace building. And we have practitioners here who have been involved for so long uh, in this peace journey in all kinds of ways, community engagement, dialogue, political dialogue, mediatorships, mentorships in terms of communities. And I'm delighted to introduce them to you. They're going to speak for a few minutes each. Less is more, by the way, with the look at this crowd here, you know. And then we'll have a conversation and I hope you'll join in. So let me welcome, starting at this side, the Reverend Dr. Leslie Carroll, who is currently our prison ombudsman, but has a CV that goes like this in terms of all the things that Leslie has been involved in in our society. Uh, Presbyterian minister back in the day as well, but also, like myself, I should say, yeah. uh, back in the day, but also the, the Victims Forum, all, all kinds of ways in which she's engaged in um, community building throughout her many careers. Next to uh, Leslie is Pat Hines, who is the director of Community and Political Dialogue with the Glen Cree Centre for Peace and Reconciliation. 50, or 50 years now, isn't it? Glen Cree has been doing extraordinary work. And uh, Pat has been involved in all kinds of networks of uh, engagement and dialogue in involving government, society, communities, and individuals. Next to Pat is Mary Montague. Sorry, excuse me, Dr. Emily Stanton. I can't read my own handwriting, Emily. Uh, who is the Programme Director for Community Relations in Schools. Emily has a PhD in Peace Studies and Conflict Resolution and is the author of Theorising Civil Society and Peace Building out in paperback, you know, Peace Building Cells. 
And, and next to Emily, of course, is Mary Montague, who since 1975, you're not sure at Mary at all, but since 1975, has been involved in peacemaking with uh, mediation, mentoring communities, and she is the author of Relationships to Reconciliation. Let's welcome our final panel of the day. <laughs> Up first, Dr. Stanton, take it away. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in the conference today with its focus on the important role that civil society has played in peace building here in Northern Ireland. I am passionate about bringing to light the many untold stories of peace, and today's conference has provided this much needed opportunity. I'm also delighted to be asked to join this particular panel, Reconciliation, Navigating a Path to Peace, to join with those I hold in high esteem, such as Mary and Leslie, and of course the good work of Glen Cree, which Pat will talk about, it's truly an honor. So I'd like to thank the conference organizers for this invitation. So today I'm wearing uh, several hats as I speak about Cori Mila. Firstly, as a former volunteer who worked with the Cori Mila community from 1992, returning again in 1994 to 1995, as ceasefires were announced, and yet again in 1999 to conduct my master's research on Kari Milo's reconciliation programs. And finally, becoming a community member myself in the 2000s when we settled back here in Belfast. So secondly, I am a practitioner and a researcher, and in my day job, I am the director of programs at Community Relations and Schools, a charity which has for almost 40 years supported schools to engage in peace building. And just prior to starting at Chris, I completed my doctoral research, as William mentioned, uh, examining Northern Ireland's civil society peace builders, theorizing lessons learned from 50 years of practice. Lastly, you'll notice right away that I am not a native, but as I have been living, working, and studying here these last 30 years, I now think I have become a little bit of an insider, outsider. <laughs> That's given me a particular lens so wearing all these various hats today, I hope to consider Kari Mila's individual role during the 1990s in particular, along with wider civil society's contributions. So recent conversations with both Trevor Williams and Colin Craig, who were the former Kari Mila's leadership at that time, were really useful. Um, and so I'm indebted to them. I'm also thank you, uh, thanking to uh, Tim and um, Alex, who are here today to fact check me on anything I get wrong, so thank you for extending the invitation to me to speak on behalf of Corey Mill. So I hope to do all these things in 15 minutes or less, which is always a challenge. So a little bit about my story. I first arrived in Northern Ireland in January of 1992. I was 21 and I came as part of a study abroad program from the USA. My degree was in peace studies a topic almost unheard of at the time. People used to say, you mean there's a degree in that? <laughs> the purpose of our program, what we signed up for, was to come to Northern Ireland to learn about peace from the local people here who are already well advanced in seeking to transform their conflict. That first day was a blur. I was sleep deprived from the overnight flight but I do recall a kaleidoscope of my first impressions. The extra security and metal detectors and dedicated Belfast wing at London Heathrow, designed for those flying only to Northern Ireland. The checkpoint we passed after arriving at Elder Grove International Airport, manned by the British Army, dressed in camouflage, rifles at the ready. And the long, gray, misty drive up the north coast on our way to Karimila. Our local program leader, the late Mervyn Love, was warm and welcoming as he tried to reassure us. Mm. Now, if it wasn't so rainy, you could almost just see it. This is a really beautiful view of the Atlantic Ocean on the coastline. And, and Scotland, I promise you, it's really beautiful. Finally, after a long journey up a windy and very narrow, steep hill, we held our breath as the bus lurched into first gear. <laughs> we arrived at Crimea. Windswept and groggy, we were greeted by a diverse group of international volunteers 
waiting for us with a warm welcome, a roaring fire, and the first of many cups of tea. For those of you who don't know, although I know many well, Carmela was founded in 1965, predating the outbreak of the Troubles. This makes Carmela the island's oldest reconciliation center. Located on the cliff overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, just a mile from the village of Bally Castle, Carmela was founded by Ray and Kathleen Davy and a group of students from Queen's University, where Ray was chaplain. In 1986, Ray Davy wrote that Carmela was founded in the early 60s out of the awareness of a need that in this deeply polarized society, some initiative should be taken to bring people together. These founders of, of Carmela were convinced that an engaged and relevant Christian faith required a commitment to ecumenism and reconciliation. Over these next decades, Carmela became both people, a dispersed lay community of more than 100 members dedicated to living out the values of reconciliation in their own lives and communities, but Carmela was, of course, also a place. During the height of the years of the Troubles, Carmela's residential center took on a hosting role, offering respite to trauma-impacted families, supporting youth encounters, facilitating cross-community schools work, bringing together interfaith clergy and their congregations, and supporting families whose loved ones were in prison, just to name a few. My 1992 memories, as I recall them, were of Carimila's peaceful location, warm hospitality, openness, and welcome, which presented a stark contrast to the conflict fatigue and militarism that had seemed to become normalized into everyday life. Both its place and people seemed to be offering something counter-cultural. And Carmela wasn't an exception, as they would be the first to point out. All across civil society at the time, we encountered a plethora of community and voluntary groups across the island dedicated to carving out some space for peace. In the context of a political vacuum, the groundswell of activity left me surprised, inspired, and curious to understand it, hence my later doctoral research. And at this stage of the conference, I hope we can agree that civil society's contribution did indeed pave a path to peace and the eventual negotiated political agreement. I would argue one of the reasons civil society's role has been vital across so many years, long before and well after 1998, is because it has supplied what I call peace-building capital. So what do I mean by peace-building capital? Civil society supplied the right mix of people, what John Paul Lederach has called a critical yeast of human resources, including the trusted networks, the fresh ideas, and the new conceptual frameworks beyond zero-sum mindsets. Together, civil society introduced and trialed new conflict resolution skills, such as mediation, restorative practices, and trauma awareness, which ultimately both peacemaking and peace building would require. Civil society also created new shared spaces and places against a backdrop of a dangerous and divided contested geography. These spaces were used to host dialogues on difficult topics, often under the radar, quietly. This testing out and trialing became the building blocks for social change, the peace building capital. Built and used when necessary, at the right time, well before and after 1998. I'll continue to flesh out the idea of peace building capital more by focusing on Karimila's unique contributions from my perspective. As I reflect on Corimila as both people and place, I suggest both have been important. So, Corimila as people. Extending the metaphor of navigating a path to peace, when a destination is unknown, people can become a compass for each other. 
From its inception, Corrymeela benefited from a diversity of people interested in building a community together, despite and because of their differences. Community was viewed as an idea that had a central vehicle for learning together. Learning how to build a new relationship with each other. Daring to talk about taboo topics, politics, religion, sectarianism, violence, and the human potential to be either a perpetrator or a victim, or both. What I observed in the 1990s was Karimila opening its doors to outsiders, people from all over the world who also became a compass, bringing new thinking and new ideas to help guide the navigation. For example, the Dutch theologian Ruhl Kapitan came many times to Northern Ireland to work with Kari Mela, introducing the Girardian concept of mimesis and its role in fueling conflict. Frank Wright's research on ethnic frontiers, working with Derek Wilson and Duncan Morrow, created new conceptual frameworks which helped local practitioners begin to build maps to understand conflict dynamics better. Karimila's people, the community members and staff, also learned from each other. They had hard conversations. They challenged the tacit rules learned by living in a divided society. And they sometimes, some might argue often, offended each other. But they worked through it. They stayed in relationship. And they began to model what living in a plural society might require. Above the front door in the Bally Castle Center, there has always been a sign. Carmela begins when you leave. And in their everyday lives, in the early 1990s, members of Carmela taught in the prisons, led women's community development initiatives, were members of the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights, supported families living on interfaces, helped begin integrated schools, where ex-prisoners committed to peace, introduced mediation to solve local parading disputes, and advised and supported the then RUC on reform and organizational change, years before the patent report was ever published. Corimila as a place. Now, in reflecting on the importance of Corimila as a place and space for the practice of peace building, my years as a volunteer come to mind. In practice, if not in words, Karimila asked every group who came to stay to suspend generations of mistrust in both symbolic and practical ways. Cross-community groups staying for a weekend, for example, entered into what might be described as a liminal space, where new rituals of everyday life were shared. At mealtimes, strangers sat together at big tables, chatting together, discussing the ups and downs of ordinary life, drinking tea, and then washing up together. Groups were asked to share bathrooms. Many even had to share a bedroom with someone that they, had been, they may have considered 24 hours earlier, if not an enemy, at least the other. The doors had no locks on the outside. Worship, always optional, was shared. It was led by volunteers, and equally as likely to be a message of peace inspired by the rock band U2, as it was, or could have been, a liturgy from the Bible. The act of creating new and shared lived experiences for anyone and everyone who came to stay in this windswept bucolic setting has an impact that is hard to measure. Elise Boulding, a Quaker peace activist and scholar, has described that in the midst of conflict, it is important to be able to engage in what she described as future visioning. I suspect that these experiences enabled a glimpse of a possible future. Colin Craig, former director of Kari Mila during the 1990s, reminded me when we spoke recently that when you are lost, you need to find a fixed point. As I draw to the end and reflecting on navigating a path to reconciliation, Corimila, I would argue, as a place and space provided, when needed, a fixed point. As members of civil society, over years investing time building trusting relationships between people, 
offered a compass towards empathy, courage, and resilience for the journey. And as the peace process continued to unfold, when the timing was ripe, key relationships, key thinking, key experiences had already been built. To borrow the well-known quote, the path was made by walking. In this way, Kari Mila, like so many others involved in peace building from civil society, helped supply the peace capital that was so deeply required at the time and still is to this day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. And, and next up is Pat. Welcome, Pat. Very much. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, colleagues. Let me begin by expressing my thanks to Connell and to Stephen for uh, inviting me to participate in the event this afternoon. It's, uh, it's been uh, very interesting, a great pleasure to hear all the various perspectives. Um, and as the previous speaker said, uh, I'm not from these parts either, as you can tell by my brogue, so I hope you'll forgive me um, in my expressions. Uh, I might begin, uh, if I may, with the concept of the Glencree Centre uh, and how it came to, to be as an idea and ultimately as a physical place. Um, the late 1960s and 70s saw the reignition of age-old enmities and tensions between nationalists and unionists in Northern Ireland. One community seeing itself trapped as a minority within the state, while the other, uh, ever vigilant, uh, never to be a minority uh, community, trapped within what they seen as a hostile island. And while there had been a steady and unrelenting level of violence leading to the introduction of internment in 1971, the period that followed saw the killing of unarmed civilians by the paratrooper regiment in Ballymurphy that August, followed by further killings uh, by the regiment in 1972. Um, the British government, of course, decided to act uh, through its power to suspend Stormont uh, and as part of an effort to establish a new basis for partic political participation by the two sections of Northern Ireland's divided society. On the 21st of July 1972, the ferocity of the violence reached uh, an almost unimaginable nadir uh, when 26 separate car bomb explosions claimed the lives of nine people and injured over 130. And the reaction, of course, generally was shock and disbelief. But in Dublin, a small number of people, including Uno Higgins O'Malley, um, Lady Eleanor Wicklow, John Kelly and Frank Purcell, formed a group that would become and would be the nucleus of the Glencree idea. And as 1973 gave way to 1974, the Sunningdale Agreement gave a, a glimmer of hope that there might be just the possibility of a newly formed parish-sharing executive might offer those who were engaged in violence a pathway towards and true to politics to pursue their aims. So those first five months of 1974 was to be short-lived, however, and the opposition, as we know, by the Ulster Workers' Council, um, seeing a slide towards, what they seen as a slide towards the United Ireland resulted in thousands of workers withdrawing their labour in the form of a general strike that led to the downfall of Brian Faulkner's executive, which of course included nationalists, including Jerry Fitt, Austin Curry, Paddy Devlin and John Hume. So it was against this background of despair that Una O'Higgins, the daughter of the assassinated Free State Minister Kevin O'Higgins, many of you will be aware we're celebrating or commemorating the end of the, uh, the Civil War this year. A hundred years ago, the Irish Civil War ended and Kevin O'Higgins was the Minister of Justice responsible for the signing of the 77 execution warrants uh, in, in that Civil War, uh, Republicans who were, who were executed, one of which was his, his best friend and his best man at his wedding, Rory O'Connor, of course, who occupied the, the garrison in the forecourts. So his daughter carried with her this sense of, in many respects, failure by the um, preceding generation to reach the appropriate accommodation uh, in 1921 22 resulted in the civil war and she carried this name and believed in many respects that we we were what we were witnessing in those early 1970s was the second civil war on the island of ireland about the same thing the failure to agree the physical space uh, in the context of a relationship with her nearest neighbor um, so she approached dr garrett fitzgerald in 1974 looking for some opw sites that might be used for for dialogue and for respite uh, as a consequence of those travelling down from Northern Ireland at that time during the height of the violence. So between 1976 and 1994, the centre was engaged primarily in dialogue around the outworking of the violence and how communities were being impacted by an ever-worsening security situation. 
In August of 1994, the then provisional IRA leadership called the cessation of all military operations. This decision was followed in October of the same year by the three main loyalist organizations who in turn ended their campaign uh, in, in October. I found myself as a 24-year-old member of the Fianna Fáil National Executive. This is where I feel like George Bush and his shoes are going to start flying over my, <laughs> over my shoulder. But anyway, um, the, uh, I was a member of that National Executive. I was asked by my party to attend a political dialogue workshop at the Glencree Centre. And the request had come from members of the Young Unionist Party, advisors and officers seeking Glencree to reach out to Fianna Fáil to uh, engage in a dialogue with this UUP group. And so that weekend of the 23rd of October 1994 would mark the first anniversary uh, of the Shanky Road bomb in which 10 people died, including the bomber, unleashing a spiral of reprisals that we all remember. Um, uh, one of the darkest periods of the trouble, in, in fact. And yet 12 months later, uh, I'm sitting in a disused 18th century British Army barracks in County Wicklow to discuss future constitutional and institutional possibilities uh, with us, the unionists, who were seeking to hear more of our southern perspectives, uh, what a difference a year had made. So that weekend was to have a profound impact on my thinking, firstly, as to how we should discuss uh, that which would, uh, divided us all on the island, and secondly, how we should inch our way towards a shared analysis of what the needs were in any solution. And though I, although I didn't know it at the time, the answer was, of course, a process of sustained dialogue involving the maximum degree of opinion, including from the island of Great Britain, who were, after all, the party exercising the sovereign authority over Northern Ireland. And so for the next 12 years, uh, under the facilitation of Geoffrey Curry, who was present in the audience here earlier on, um, and the executive leadership of Ian White, um, Glencree became the place that I would return to month after month to meet with politicians, advisors, officials, civic leaders, church leaders, diplomats, paramilitaries and so forth from across the islands of Great Britain and Ireland. What follows are some examples of lessons I learned and experiences shared over those 12 years uh, between late 94 and early 2007. I don't propose to go through a chronology of events as, as they rolled out over the past 29 or so years. I want to focus on some of the key themes uh, which have informed my approach to political dialogue born out of the Glencree experience and other experiences. So I think the first lesson I would say is that the first thing to that really struck me and I learned in the field of political mediation is the need to create an inclusive space uh, and a process and that the, the, the space and the process is as inclusive as possible. This won't result in everybody turning up on day one. In fact, one of the things I discovered early on is that when mediators attempt to bring together those groups of individuals who have practiced undemocratic methods prior to their entry into political process, most Democrats head through the nearest door or the window, whichever is nearer, uh, this serves to illustrate the enormous amount of time required in a process prior to the parties entering a room. This process included managing expectations of those uh, who will be there and in some cases an outline of the general topics to be discussed. The role of political parties and governments in these processes tended to be at track 1.5 levels and although there were occasions when senior political leaders took part in our work in order to underscore the value of what they felt was required around some of the discussions. So a balance had to be found around the principle of a maximum inclusion versus self-exclusion as a result of actions or unwillingness by participants to accept relevant and, and other ground rules. And this brings me to the concept I learned when there was a critical number of actors in each or other party or grouping willing to participate in an ongoing process of dialogue designed to humanize relationship, this, relationships. This issue of humanizing relationships was, was one that struck me early on. The dialogue is not a negotiation, so dialogue is not a negotiation. There are no interests traded or transacted. In my experience in those 1990s, the people and groups that I encountered had never met before, never conceded that there was anything to discuss in terms of fundamental positions uh, they had held to. So each month, sometimes two or three weeks groups and so on would come down over those feather breads along that military road uh, with party colleagues and associates to discuss the state of the peace process at various points in time. And we would arrive, have a light meal at the Glencree kitchen and then into the sitting room where there'd be a large open fire where we would take turns putting logs and briquettes and so on. Um, a fundamental rule at the outset was that participants controlled the agenda but Glencree controlled the process of engagement. 
This meant that we employed the use of what I might call dynamic dialogue, where we followed the issues, not set piece speeches around the room, where everybody received their 10 minutes to elaborate on their latest grievance about the other side of the room. But dynamic dialogue is a challenging concept because it allows for all of the emotions to become real in the moments where dialogue is most tense between participants. I was once asked what was dynamic dialogue and I said it was akin to bringing your own pickaxe handle and laying it down by the chair you sat in. You probably won't need to use it but authenticity of expression including anger and frustration were things that the facilitators were prepared to allow and deal with. The principle was, of course, moderated by the fundamental ground rule that you treated those in the room with respect, despite the frustration felt by whatever position was being advanced. I learned in those early years, as I sat in those workshops, that it would appear that there's a fundamental need that we have as human beings to be acknowledged and validated in the identity that we express ourselves to be. Nothing seemed more disrespectful to participants than to be told uh, who you should be or how invalid was the identity that you were expressing yourself to be during the course of discussions. So facilitators had to regularly check in to conversations, asking, have you heard the anger? Can you acknowledge how your remarks have created this response? Political dialogue is probably not all that different, of course, from what many of you have been involved in over decades of work in your own fields and careers. And there's little doubt, perhaps, that in some respects the stakes are a little higher um, not least when dealing with violent organisations who are trying to transition their movements into the political arena. And this takes me to the area of confidentiality and how in many and any process a facilitator wishing to engage in this work must take responsibility to ensure that those who are coming into workshops like Glen Creer or elsewhere are not placed at any additional physical risk as a result of their participation. In our work many of the people we had to go back in our work. Many of these people had to go back to their home, uh, to uncertain communities, scared about what the future held. So strict secrecy and confidentiality were our world for much of those 12 years. Unfortunately, we did experience the loss of one participant to paramilitary violence, but not as a consequence of any failure on the part of Glen Cree or the participants in our process. Nevertheless, it served to illustrate how fragile and dangerous it was for people traveling from Northern Ireland to the South for discussions and then returning home to tense and often fractious environments. Another key principle uh, in, in how about going and organizing political dialogues was the principle of no surprises. Everybody knew in advance who was going to be in the room or at a minimum what parties were either invited or were confirmed as participating. Nothing would drain the confidence of participants faster than if they walked into a dialogue expecting to have a confirmed number of actors and parties in front of them, only to be blindsided by individuals or groups which they had no prior warning. This damaged the credibility of the dialogue, the facilitator and the organisation. And a key lesson over these years, and one which I continue to employ today, is prepare, prepare and prepare even more. So many dialogues, even at the highest political levels, went wrong and produced inadequate outcomes due to the lack of preparation. Today in my work, Today in my work, I'll still undertake two, possibly four, pre-meetings uh, with participants prior to a full dialogue between participants in dispute. I like to think of it as the process of shutting down potential points of failure before we get in a room where the stakes are generally a little bit higher. Building capacity in relationships. The conflict in Ireland and more broadly with our nearest neighbours, Great Britain, was essentially at its heart a set of broken relationships broken obviously within Northern Ireland, giving rise to the most recent conflict, broken relationships between North and South following partition, and the age-old enmity that characterised the relationship with our nearest neighbours. Our task as participants and today as practitioners is to build some deep and long-lasting resilience into the relationships between participants from across the islands to create the humanising moments when party or national or other labels were traded for an acceptance that we shared the, the same home place, a place that we called home and that our common interest required us to make that home safe regardless of how we see in our individual identities. In a lot of political peace processes around the world, accepted wisdom is that you could reach an agreement if a list of preconditional requirements were met, including, for example, ceasefires, disposals of weapons, rehabilitation of former combatants, release of prisoners, etc. The difference we discovered through our work in the centre is that a peace process 
is not a set of preconditional checkboxes running vertically one to ten. Rather, it is messier than that. And our approach in Glen Cree was to take those vertical processes and turn them 90 degrees horizontally and between each of those challenges to build capacity in the relationships between the participants. Even in circumstances where, uh, where the issues were not fully resolved, people knew each other better, knew the constraints uh, that they and the other had, as well as the need to achieve certain levels of progress and why. This was vitally important when things go wrong and went wrong, like they did when the ceasefire broke down in 1996. Participants continued to attend the workshops, seeking ways to a, a restoration of the ceasefire. In other words, because we had humanized the relationships, we didn't go back to zero. One or two steps maybe, but we simply worked even harder to restore the sense of purpose in ending the violence and returning to the dialogue as a means of achieving agreement. The renowned political author and biographer Robert A. Caro once said that power reveals. I would offer in a more nuanced way dialogue reveals. It often reveals here to unseen qualities and attributes of participants who come into a room either seeking to defend or advance a set of interests and in some cases vital interests. I've learned over the years that in dialogue it was not the obvious statements of position that could be read or observed in the media that created the opportunities for forward movement. I'll be told uh, I could have read these statements and positions in any number of sources including policy statements, briefing documents in the media and so on. However, through careful, tenacious dialogue, it was possible to see what lay behind the public pronouncements, including the vulnerability of participants in terms of the room for manoeuvre on issues. These are the moments when rather than exploiting the revealed weaknesses in your interlocutor's position, you seek to shore up and assist them in order to give them the manoeuvrability to stay in the process and assure their community who look to them for progress we all won when we helped each other at critical moments and at times of maximum uncertainty. And so in the last analysis, what did I fundamentally learn over all these years? Well, a couple of things. In divided societies, violence only makes the divisions deeper and puts off the moment when dialogue can start. In contested spaces like ours where divisions are deep, like fault lines running back centuries, complexity is actually the friend of peacemaking. If you can detach people and communities away from their binary sense of themselves and demonstrate that we are outcomes of all the elements that have shaped us, not just the labels we've chosen to adopt or those that have been ascribed to us by others. Finally, the, the theme is, is, I think, apt today, paving the path. Um, and I often say we're, we're on a, 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 a road, a, a, a roadway, through a portal of accommodation. We've got to see everything in the context of accommodation. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement was this extraordinary balance of union and unity in one moment, with equal validity being given to the aspiration of both. And the difficulties we found in the last seven or so years as a consequence of Brexit have meant that the cambers on that road tend to take us into our respective ditches uh, of the single identity narrative. We've got to stay up on the center of the road uh, and, and as the, the title of the conference said, pave, pave every day a new understanding and a new willingness to reach accommodation uh, with those who differ from us. So finally, I want to just quote from what the former Taoiseach and Foreign Minister Brian Cowan said when he said, peacemaking is a journey. Don't front load the destination in the first few steps. Start the journey and let the destination take care of itself. In this way, participants can take each step they develop the trust, strengthen the relationships, and ultimately deepen their shared sense of reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And, and Brian Cowan's words really echoing the idea of the, the walk, creating the path. You know, the, the, the destination is ahead of you, but you don't have to know exactly where it is until you get there. Mary, you're up next. You look ready to go. Let's welcome Mary to the stage. So my name is Mary Montague. Um, I'm a very busy, semi-retired person. Um, a wife, a woman, a mother, a grandmother. Um, and I've worked for peace for a long time, locally and internationally, over a number of years, around 40 odds. 
Um, I was born in Belfast. My family were and still are. We are devout Catholics. Uh, I'm married 50 years and I have two children, a girl and a boy. But over those years, I have also fostered, me and my husband and family, we have fostered 40 children. We live in Andersonstown in Riverdale in the parish of St. Agnes's and St. Michael's, because it was one time one parish. I say that because I feel real pride in my community. The children I fostered were both Catholic and Protestant. Although our Protestant children only stayed for short-term uh, stays, my community welcomed all of my children, regardless of where they came from and never ask, why are they there? I never chose to be a peace builder. It was out of necessity. A war came onto my doorstep, out at my front door, actually. I wanted my children to grow up without facing violence, hatred, and division. I wanted things to change. I love my community. And today, when I talk about community, I'm talking about community regardless of politics, regardless of colour, creed, or nationality. I'm talking about people that I love. In past years, people were dying, children and adults were being injured, being traumatised, and we did have to change. We had to find another way. I want to share with you the story of my street because I think it is important to remember the communities that were really being touched by the war. In my street, my friend across the road lost her husband, murdered at the hands of loyalists. My next door neighbour She lost her sister at the hands of loyalists. My next door neighbor, her husband, he lost his brother at the hands of the IRA. My friend down the street, her little beautiful baby Angela was killed by a ricochet bullet. Originally, we thought it was from the British Army. It turned out to be from the IRA. In the midst of this, I volunteered in our parish. And it was really there that I was given an opportunity to become active in peace building. Along with three other women, we held an event after a particularly horrific incident in our parish. And our parish priest at that time, Father Toner, give us leadership to try and find another way and to have conversations with those we needed to have conversations with. So we met with the IRA and with Sinn Féin to urge them to stop. Within our parish, there were those who supported the violence and who challenged us in the whole lack of of human rights and the way the British Army were reacting in our streets. However, what we were aware, unaware of, was that at that point there was already very secretive meetings going on with politicians and others, and they were happening through Father Alec Reid. So to me, as I talk about peace building, I'm talking about how the Holy Spirit, in whatever form you believe that spirit to be, was weaving a web of change. Then through Quakers, the Society of Friends, who too were holding sensitive meetings, I, as a Catholic woman and a mother from my parish, found myself meeting and interacting with representatives of the British government, the Irish governments and others to talk about what needed to change from a mum's point of view. It wasn't really well received in some quarters in my own community. People 
some people challenged me, who did I think I was? I had to explain that I wasn't talking on behalf of anybody except myself. It was simply as a mother of many children, both Catholic and Protestant, that I addressed my feelings and spoke with anybody. I spoke with Republicans, I spoke with Loyalists, the British Army, whoever would listen. And I was given leadership from my clergy to do so. As a woman, it was difficult. I was not political in the sense of a party political person or stand for election. However, I remember when Mary Robinson, who at the time was the president of Ireland, and she came to visit Belfast, and she came again secretively and met some people like myself, women, who were trying to work for peace. And I remember that gave me such motivation to continue, because she was a very compassionate woman who brought with her other women through, through empowering us and inspiring us. Yes, we had 20,000 British troops stationed in Northern Ireland. And at times, I felt they were all stationed in my streets. There was an ongoing bombing campaign. There was murders. Increasingly, there was community division. And my community were being demonized. So what made me think that I could change anything? I didn't have any grand idea like that. I didn't have any mind-blowing plan. I was a mum, used to talking rhymes, nursery rhymes and singing and playing with my children. I just felt some small act could possibly help. And my dad was a great motivator at that time. He was a plumber. And he used to say, Mary, a dripping tap will soon fill a basin. Go out there, love, and be a drip. And that's simply what I did. What we had was a longitudinal, low-intensity war. And when you have that type of a war, relationships become very broken. Community becomes very divided. So the first thing I tried to do then was reach out to others, especially within the women's sector. And that's why I was reminding Eileen that she goes further back than she thought. The women's sector were already crossing the divide. When I did that, my first aim was to try and understand others, to challenge myself and to move out beyond my comfort zone and try to build new relationships. My piecework has focused and always has focused on the building or the rebuilding of relationships, of rehumanizing people to one another, of challenging the myths that in a divided society are there at your core, whether you recognize it or not, the myths and the misunderstandings that hold us apart. And these are things that we have to challenge. But to start it, I recognize I had to challenge myself and my own prejudices. So I started on this journey to build peace for my family and for my children, and then realized it was as more about me than anything else, my own attitudes and my own behaviors. After ceasefires were established, the scene was set for talks. And Senator George Mitchell, as you know, negotiated for two arduous years, and we've seen all the backclapping in Queens, and I think that is right. They achieved something wonderful. But what about it at the grassroots? So there was a level, there was a level of negotiation and facilitation going on there by ordinary people, many women like myself who facilitated meetings to hear what the ordinary person needed to see in a peace agreement, one that they could vote for, 
one that they could support. The engagements that we had were with people from all walks of life and organisations. And we talked about the constitutional question and we talked about cultural differences and we talked about issues such as prisoner release, victim and survivors concerns and the whole aim of this was to try and inform what might follow as an agreement. This work didn't always lead the answers. People didn't go out the door having totally agreed. But what it did do was it allowed people to meet across the divide and gain an understanding of one another and why people held the opinion they held. My work, I think, at the grassroots with Quakers, with Carmela and others, underlines the truth that peace is not just the absence of violence, nor is it something that's actually given to people through political agreements. Whilst these create an environment for change, it is the change within people's hearts and minds and spirits that transforms conflicts to sustainable peace, the word being sustainable. That is the opportunity that is offered to participants when they engage in being listened to and listening to others. Over those years, I have been privileged to make a journey with truly diverse groups, with the armed groups, with ex-prisoners, with women's groups, with victims and survivors, with the cultural and faith groups, with police, other statutory organisations and with our black minority ethnic community as well, who we now can learn a lot from. When we actually got the political agreement, I supported the drive to get people to vote yes at the referendum, both north and south. I want to mention some other women at this point not because I knew them, but because I really admired and learned from them. I was learning from two very strong women. Mo Molan was one of them, and she to me seemed unstoppable. Herself alongside Helen Jackson, an MP for Sheffield, who was her right-hand person, they tirelessly worked at hearing the voice of as many in our society as possible. Mo, despite her, her responsibilities, her hectic schedule, her feelings and her, her illness, was always striving to hear as many voices as possible and to hear the thoughts and feelings of community. She would ring me at times just to hear what my thoughts were, what's going on in the community, what are people saying, what do they think? And she phoned me one evening to talk about the visit to the prisons. And we talked about how she needed to visit all prisoners, all sides of the prison. And we discussed that, not because she needed my wisdom, but because she needed space to think with somebody who would just listen and who she was in relationship with. When my daughter would answer the phone, Mo always found time to have a chat. She would talk to her about her university studies. In later years, it was a real privilege for me and my daughter to be invited by her family to the celebration of Mo's life. Again, a key part of all of this was the relationship we had. And she even brought us into her family <coughs> discussions when they even knew about somebody called Mary Montague and her daughter. One event to promote the agreement was one with loyalist groups, one of the loyalist armed groups, who had asked for support in explaining the agreement to their members. I remember so clearly being so nervous a Catholic from Anderson's town, 
from this rampant Republican area, as it stated in earlier days in our media, talking to a group on such an important topic. I was very lucky to be accompanied by Duncan Morrow, who had a sound head. It was really, really interesting. As they walked in the door, they began to uh, introduce themselves. Oh, you're Mary, I'm so-and-so. And I was going, I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. Do you want to know your name? But they were actually being marked as being present. They had to be at that workshop. And there was around 150 to 200 participants in that place that evening. I knew the leaders and I knew them very well, so I wasn't worried about my safety. I was just worried that we would get it right. On the southern side of the border, the discussion was equally important as within this agreement, the article within the Irish constitution claiming territorial rights over the whole island was being removed. And interestingly, I remember the opposition I faced on the southern side of the border. And I'm not sure how much understanding there is of the significance of the Irish voters agreeing to change the Irish constitution, or even if today it is recognised here in Northern Ireland how the right to be British is actually much more protected than ever before. We all held our breath and we got to the, 90, the 71 per cent in Northern Ireland of a yes and the 94 per cent in the South. And yet outside, the wrangling continued politically and the power share and assembly, it didn't meet, it didn't meet, it was there, it was suspended. The ordinary people who had faced all the suffering over the years were once again being forced to carry the burdens of our societal divisions. And the politics that we were surrounded with were really political rivalries being raged openly. The agreement itself even has been put on trial. There was talk about what others gained and what others lost. And the age-old divisions underpinned feelings within those communities of being left behind, of seeing no progress economically or no reduction of community strife. And sadly, as Eileen said earlier, there are still communities feeling that today. The agreement was not being explained in terms of being a new chance, an opportunity for us all, new beginnings. Instead, it had become a diet of fear, betrayal, continuing to be served up and creating tension and maintaining the fear. And this manifested itself at the interfaces. So in Coromila, as the interface worker in Coromila, I began working in Belfast, Porter Down, and in Londonderry, Stoke Derry, whatever you want to call it. And I was privileged as the Coromila worker to walk alongside these communities. They had lived at the cold face of the war. Within a one mile radius of a community house where I was working, 563 people had died as a result of the troubles. The level of fear in those areas was so high, we brought people up to Coromila and they asked, are you not locking the doors? Which was something we never did because they wanted the doors locked. They were used to even pulling wardrobes and furniture across doors to keep them safe. <clears throat> we set up a great system, it was a bleeper. I thought we were very high tech. We had a bleeper uh, system where people could get in touch with me if there was trouble at an interface and then I could contact the other side, whoever they might be. Of course, we did become sophisticated eventually and we were given mobile phones that were like bricks. 
But however, this did enable crisis management within and between the communities on site instead of somebody else outside telling them what was going on. They were in control themselves. And I acted as a mediator, going between them during times of heightened violence to help calm situations and encourage communication. But the nurturer in me, the mom in me, saw that there was a need to bring community development into those areas, just as we had done in my own parish, to build capacity and to help people have some answers to the needs that they had. And so we, op we offered them the opportunity um, of gaining some access to the peace monies, because a lot of communities at grassroots were too small for this very sophisticated application system and they had to be supported in that. I moved on to be one of the founding directors of Tides Training, which is still very much in operation, a peace-building organization here in Northern Ireland. It began its life in my spare bedroom. And I remember when we received our charitable status, being overwhelmed, oh, how wonderful this is, oh my Lord, now I'm in charge of this organisation and with charitable status. How scary is that? I'm a mum. But the aim of our charity was to build the capacity of grassroots mediators and peace builders because I wanted Tides to be working in such a way that it worked itself out of a job, that we passed on that capacity. And I am very delighted and very privileged to be able to say I walked with those communities and they are doing it for themselves. They are doing it through having participated in our training, um, having found and recognised their own skills and their own innate wisdom. Because nobody understands the circumstances better than the people living with that conflict in that community. We have witnessed times when the peace was really put at risk. For example, the outbreak of Huden, the threats to workers when they were doing essential maintenance in places, the sectarian threats, the cultural expression that was becoming contested, the parades, the flags, the language, all of this creating heightened tension. But during these periods, I have again the privilege of having collaborated directly with the communities that that was affecting and the key people within those communities. And alongside them, designing and delivering the interventions to avert conflict. Today, we have no sitting government. The grassroots people and the co cooperation and the relationships that they have built across the divide is for me the little signs of our peace. They are the ones that are upholding the peace at the grassroots. But I came in at this talk starting to mention about children, because children have always been key for me and a key reason why I do the work. I want to share a story the story of two children in particular. One I'll call Colin, not his real name. He and his family attended Quaker College when I was a children's worker there. Colin's behaviour could be challenging. In fact, he just loved bouncing off the walls. But to help children talk about feelings, I had a fancy box that was magic. I hope you have one in your home. Because when you hold this box and when the child held it, they could be whoever they wanted to be. They could be wherever they wanted to be. This day, Colin said he wanted to be God. And he said he wanted to take all the bad blood that had poured out of people and put it all back in because his friend's father could be alive again. 
He talked how his father's dad was shot dead on the doorstep and how this meant that his friend and his family had moved away and he had no longer his, his friend to play with. He went on to say, if, <clears throat> if I was God, I would get everyone to talk to one another and to throw all the guns into the sea and to stop shooting one another. Colin, my friends in this room, was six years of age. This was expressed by Colin in 1992. In January 30th, 1973, way before that, Philip Rafferty disappeared from Anderson's town. He was 13. He was a very beautiful boy, very sweet. He was part of the Legion of Mary, which in my community meant that he would have been a visitor to older people doing their gardens, etc., etc. Philip was abducted by a loyalist gang, brutally, brutally beaten and shot dead. He was buried from our parish not long before his 14th birthday. He is dead 50 years this year, yet we all still grieve and mourn for him. What touched me was that his parents held no vengeance in their heart, just a terrible sense of loss, compassion for others who had suffered similar loss, and a deep, deep faith. Their faith helped carry all of us through that terrible time. I hold Philip in my heart, and every day I try to do my peace building in a way that he would be pleased with because I dedicate it to him and to his memory. We have talked last week about heroes and unsung heroes and all of this talk has gone on. I want to say that Maureen, his mum, for me, is an unsung hero. Although she had lost her young son, she continued, even today, she continues to bring love to her family and community and others. She has never looked for revenge. She has never taught hatred. She went on afterwards to work in the children's hospital in the premature baby ward. In fact, she loved several hundreds of children and helped them and their families for many years. Even during COVID, she was still knitting tiny hats and boutiques. Maureen is now 90. And just the other week, when I sat down with her, she said, I don't know who carried out the murder. I don't think I'll ever know. But Maureen wants to embrace a peaceful future. So for me, all the mums and all the victims and survivors, they are our unsung heroes because they carry the scars. In the, the dictionary it says, the meaning of reconciliation is the act of causing two people or groups to become friendly again after an argument or disagreement. It is a journey. Am I reconciled? No, I'm a work in progress. Because with each challenge, I have to check how am I feeling? How am I looking at that group in society? And that's, for me, what recon reconciliation is, a journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. That was incredible. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Leslie. Thank you for um, sticking with it. I think you're learning one of the lessons of peacemaking. Sometimes uh, you nearly lose the will to live, but you have to keep on going anyway. So here we are, um, nearly at the end. Um, I, I want to uh, reflect a little bit on 
what I think the question I had going around in my head was, what were you doing in the years coming up to the Good Friday Agreement? So just to reflect a little bit on that and to pull up maybe some, some things that we could strive for um, in the future and some lessons that I learned. But first of all, to say thank you, uh, Connell and others, for the invitation to be here. It is particularly delightful to hear names like Kate Kelly um, and to hear the names of some who have gone on ahead of us but who bring a smile to our face whenever we hear their names, Tom Toner, Alec Reid and Una Higgins O'Malley and so many others. Um, so it, it, it's so good to remember that vast community of people who were engaged in all sorts of activities that together assisted the peace um, to arrive with the Good Friday Agreement um, and indeed uh, taught us many lessons for how to go on from there. So who, who am I um, and what had I got to do with anything coming up to the Good Friday Agreement? Well, in some ways very little, but every little matters. Um, and what made me who I am at that time, or, or who I was at that time in my life, and I think probably still am, uh, was, was the faith that I was born into. So like Mary, um, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a person of faith and that that mattered and shaped and made me who I am. I also want to acknowledge, because Damien Gorman very ungently reminded us that churches aren't great places at times, so I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, but the faith that I read about, particularly in the Bible, um, was what inspired and made me who I was. So what was I doing coming up to the Good Friday Agreement? Where was I? Well, I was sometimes in a front room in a Christian brother's house with a group of women. You couldn't see with the nicotine smoke in the room. Those were great days. You could smoke in a room. Fantastic. Um, you couldn't see your finger in front of you. You knew people were in tears, um, and you knew people were pouring their soul out, and that's where Wave was born. Uh, Alan talked about it being women in the first instance, widows against violence and power, they named themselves in those days. Um, and sometimes, mostly on a Sunday afternoon, or in the early 90s, that's where you could find me. Sometimes I was over in an office in East Belfast. You entered by the fire escape, lest anyone see you, and... Uh, we were talking there to loyalists or listening more often to what they were saying about themselves and about where they were at. Sometimes you would have found me in an orange hall um, and on one occasion somebody introduced me and said, Leslie's here because she's contacts with the other side. I wasn't sure which other side he was talking about really. Um, but interesting that they wanted to hear what was going on on the other side of the wall. Sometimes you would have found me in a room in church house with my own people, wrestling as hard there in debate and discussion as I might have in an office in East Belfast with loyalists, or indeed as I might have in an office up at Stormont with the Secretary of State who thought I was up to no good, or in the front very small room of a house in Bombay Street um, where Alec Reid and I sat on a very cold day waiting for somebody to arrive. We didn't know who it was going to be. Somebody did arrive and we talked about decommissioning for a long, long time. And then a figure arrived in the door and there was no more light and it was Jerry Adams. Filled the, the whole doorway. Now you can imagine, I'm from Tyrone. A small girl from Tyrone nearly died at that point. But on went the conversation about decommissioning. Or sometimes in a house in Lisburn, um, in a study actually, with loads of books in it and lots of music. I never saw so much music in my life and speakers that were this height. That was David Trimble's house. And sometimes you could have found me in a convent um, in North Belfast or in Dublin or in an army barracks or in a pulpit. Sometimes I actually got in the pulpit. A pulpit that at that time in my life embodied the challenge that was sitting right there in front of us. So I w worked in a congregation in North Belfast on Duncairn Gardens. Back of the church opened into the new lodge. Front of the church opened into Tigers Bay and the pulpit sat right on the peace line. So we were cut in two by our history. And the gospel that inspired me had a lot to say to that. I think more than the gospel, it's something to say to me. When we were doing work, we lifted the floor in the pulpit and found a rosary in there. So somebody was obviously trying to exercise some influence on us Presbyterians. <laughs> I also sometimes was in the lounge at Clonard 
monastery in a variety of embassies and you know we've all been there the Arras Hillsborough Castle I slept in John Manger's bed actually in Hillsborough Castle thank God he wasn't in it <laughs> and sometimes I was walking around a car park listening to something somebody wanted to tell to the people on the other side and we couldn't sit in a room because people can listen in when you're sitting in a room pick up the message early in the morning, find your way to somebody on the other side, pass the message over and let it go up the line. And many's and many's a time you find me burying the dead of ordinary people whose lives were utterly destroyed by the country that we were living in and by the times that we were living through. Who was it said complexity? You, uh, Pat, you said complexity is the friend of peacemaking. Um, that complex experience and melee of life in the early 90s that was my life was a friend of peacemaking for me and a, a great inspiration. And it seems to me that Christian people at that time and, and still potentially do have enough trust to be able to go into those different places, to be able to go in in a way that's trusted, um, to hear what's going on there, to tell the stories with faithfulness. We should use that for good. If, if, we're, if we're church people at all, we should use that for good. And if we're not church people and we're, we're annoyed at the church, um, and many of you might well be, then you need to speak to your churches and say, you have a position that you can use for good. Get out and use it. We don't always do that. The other thing I think that was really important for me as a young person growing up uh, in Tyrone in a Presbyterian community were two things that I learned from my faith. One was personal responsibility and the other was responsibility for others. So why did I bother doing any of what I was doing? It was because it was my duty and my responsibility because that's what I read in the Bible. I was absolutely fascinated by the enemy and the notion of the enemy fascinated by a Bible that told me to love my enemy, to pray for the people who persecuted me or made my life difficult. And if you lived in Tyrone, at the time I lived in Tyrone, you had no doubt who your enemy was. We weren't allowed to play with the children behind us. Um, we weren't allowed to go to mass when our Catholic neighbors were, were shot dead. We weren't allowed to do so many things with people who were the enemy. And maybe they weren't the enemy at all. And I was fascinated by why they were the enemy and fascinated by a faith that told me I had to love them regardless. My neighbours were always my responsibility um, and that never changed for me. Responsibility for others and much of this was about silence, was about taking care of the confidence that you were given, about taking care to be faithful to the story that you were told so that you could pass it on in a faithful way. I think, Bruno, when I was listening to you, I was, I was almost jealous of the groups that you belonged to, so many groups that you named, uh, this woman's group and that woman's group and the other woman's group. I so often felt completely alone. Sometimes peacemaking requires that we go it alone because it's the right thing to do. And yet we're not alone, we're never alone because making peace and building a pathway to peace, you're part of a massive community of people. Sometimes they have to be silent about what they're doing, but that doesn't mean they're not doing it. So all of that, um, as a follower of Jesus Christ, opened up a pathway for me in many different respects. I particularly appreciated the conversations with Sinn Féin um, up in Clonard. Um, and I, I, I was often uh, in receipt of a phrase from one, one of the folks there, and he used to say to me regularly, get off your cross. So as a unionist, I need to get off my cross. There's only one cross that's needed. There's only one victim that was ever required. Get off the, ex off the cross, take responsibility, and do your bit to change the world. That's what was going on in my head. And I suppose the other thing then, um, just coming near the end, you'll be glad to know. Uh, Christian people have a particular re relationship with the past. Um, if you don't go to church now, you may have in the past, and you will remember probably, um, that we gather regularly to share bread and wine. So we do remembering. And we remember a man who set out to do good and ended up on a cross. 
But we don't do remembering to be sad, and we don't do remembering to be stuck in the past. We do remembering to get out of our seat after we've eaten the bread and after we've drunk the wine and go and do some good. So Christian people have a very particular relationship with their past. We shouldn't live in it, yet we are rooted in it. And certainly we go over and over it to understand it, but we remember for the future, and our job is to die to live. I um, remember a headline in a newspaper, and I think it was at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, but you know your memory can file things wrongly at times, um, but that's, that's what I associate the headline with, and it was on the front of the paper, it was like a cartoon picture, and it, it had the guys round the, the guys, round the table negotiating the peace, and there were these ghosts hovering on their shoulders, and the, the headline was the ghosts on their shoulders. We all have ghosts on our shoulders. Um, at some point in our history, people had to get over the ghosts on their shoulders and sign on a dotted line and make peace with each other. And I don't think we're in any different a place than we are today. We, we still have ghosts on our shoulders. We still have things to do. We still have dotted lines to sign on and a future to build. Today, I, I work, as William said, in prisons. I investigate deaths in custody and serious incidents from which death might have occurred. And I investigate complaints from prisoners. Um, and if you thought prisons are, were a, a, a kind of a temperature gauge during the troubles, you should continue to think that now. They're a good gauge of, of where society is at and what needs to be done. So for those of you working out in communities, it will be no news to you that we need to do something about drugs. We need to do something about mental ill health. We need to do something about neurodiversity and people not receiving the education and support that they need. I have all these people in prison. I talk to them every day. These are people who have never had enough to help them be the people that they can be. We recently installed scanners. You probably heard about it on the news. Um, we expected to find lots of drugs coming in and out of prison. We found probably three times as many as we expected to find, which is staggering and shocking. And if that's, if that's a measure of society, then we need to pay attention to that. Um, I work with many people from your world. They come into the care of the prisons. We need to address all of that, a broken society um, with voices that need to be heard. I think we still need to build a society in which no one needs to feel ashamed and no one needs to feel left out and everyone needs to feel that they've got something to offer. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a couple of questions from you guys in a, in a second. We've got about 10 minutes or so before the end of the day. But the themes here of, of uh, peace building and reconciliation being a path, and sometimes it's one-to-one, -one, right? Sometimes it's a small group. Sometimes it can be political parties in conversation or groups of parties. Looking at the bigger picture in terms of this society, we have clearly made progress, haven't we, since 1998 in terms of peace and reconciliation as a path that this society's on. Where would you say we are, though, Mary, as a society? How far along that journey do you think we are? I think if you look at the different parts of society and so far as political and the grassroots, etc., even in, within civil society organizations, I think grassroots are way ahead towards reconciliation mm. than what our politicians are. Yeah. And I think when, because Ty's also worked with the police, with the housing, uh, with the housing executive and housing providers and all of that, I think the systems that are in place were put in place at a time when we had the war and conflict. Mm. I think some of the systems need to change and some of the people like our civil servants need to re-engage in a different way and mm. see the value. Uh, politics and p politicians and civil servants need to see the value of engaging with ordinary people again. Um, but I think that 
I mean, for me, the good news is the grassroots people, it didn't, Brexit did not erupt people, did not go in, go, go back into, re, you know, grabbing guns and yeah. going to whole, st whole scale violence. Yeah. So. They just went to Tesco looking for broccoli. Yeah. Couldn't find it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in, in, in seriousness, I think yeah. those relationships have to be applauded. Right. And, um, and we have to congratulate our grassroots people. Let me pick up on that point about the politicians, Pat. Um, some of the programs we've done recently looking at sectarianism, and that wasn't resolved by the Good Friday Agreement. It wasn't trying to resolve sectarianism. It was dealing with a negotiated peace uh, agreement. But it, it's, it's rife. It, it's a very polarized society still. We still have those walls, in fact, more than we had before. And, and the suggestion is sometimes made that actually the politicians benefit from the sectarianization of our society. They, they benefit from the polarization, the corralling of the votes in segregated areas works to the advantage sometimes of politicians. And, and we have political parties who often think in a very short term trajectory just to the next election. And you can dangle fear in front of people or whatever and get them through that election, win some votes. If that, I'm not sure if you agree with that analysis, first of all, tell us if you do, but if that is correct as an analysis, um, can you bring those politicians into a peace and reconciliation journey and how? I mean, I think the first thing I would say is it's, it, look, it, it's very important that we don't necessarily blame the people who aren't in the room or sitting around with us right now in terms of just uh, ascribing a particular degree of responsibility or otherwise. I, I would always say as well that politicians don't fall out of the sky. They're placed there at the hands of thousands and thousands of voters who, who return them time after time. Um, I think we have to accept as well that um, 25 years is but a blink of an eye in the context of the longevity mm -hmm. of the fault line that divides our communities. Just a blink of an eye. Mm. And I describe it almost like as the, as the weight of history between the islands of Britain and Ireland. All that weight of history, 400 years, unfortunately or fortunately rests on the shoulders, squarely on the shoulders of the two communities. Uh, on this small part of the island of Ireland. Yeah. And so it behoves governments and politicians beyond Northern Ireland to take responsibility for the weight of that history and shoulder it equally. Um, so I, I just always be cautious and careful, uh, not necessarily to jump to blaming people who aren't necessarily sitting around with us. Um, as I say, politicians are also navigating their own trade winds. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's within their own political parties or within their communities. And while we have made enormous strides, and Mary's correct, um, when I consider the violence that um, preceded, indeed, the first ceasefire, the ferocity of that 18 months, you know, you remember, Leslie, 93, 94, um, and you think of where we are today, um, we're in a, a much better place. I think the politics and the governance, and I think you began with this point yourself, uh, William, that, that's, that's a different matter. And that's, yes. for, that's for electors and for voters for sure. to determine yeah. what is the nature of society they want and the politics they want uh, in their environment. But I would say this in conclusion, um, because the future remains contested, it isn't certain, and we see demographic changes and so on, that in itself is going to bring ever increasing levels of uncertainty. And yeah. therefore, what I had said earlier was that we're on this road, having passed through the portal of accommodation in 1998, we need to understand that every day yeah. is an accommodation. Every day you get up, uh, mm -hmm. whether you're a politician, a community worker or whatever, y you're gonna he hear a diametrically opposed view coming at you. And how do you reach accommodations with those yes. in that contested space? And, and thank you for that reminder, the generations of uh, trauma, generations of conflict. 25 years isn't a long time in terms of the history of, of a conflict in a region, a whole region. Where do you think we are, Leslie, in terms of that journey as a society? Well, I actually think we're further on than we let ourselves believe. Mm. Um, but the trouble is that if we don't let ourselves believe it, then we will actually be further back. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we've done, we've done well. And Mary's right, there are people who are further on maybe than others. Um, but we have a way to go, uh, mm. and we're challenged by the lack of 
current lack of resources and we'll be challenged further probably when our budget arrives and we know what happens in a situation like that. People begin to compete with each other all the harder um, and, and fight about the limited resources. So I think that's going to take all our peacemaking skills and effort um, to, to remi remind each other and one another um, that a, unless we work together, we're going to get nowhere especially when there are fewer resources. Yeah, we need a lot of mindfulness classes for the sound of it. <laughs> where do you think we are? And where, where, where would you like us to be in terms of this stage, 25 years on, how are we doing? So obviously, you know, the fact that I came in 1992 with those kind of very strong memories yeah. of a very militarized society, I can see the huge difference um, that that change has made for the better in the sense that even the new Ulster University in downtown Belfast, huge sheets of glass all over, which wouldn't be possible in the previous uh, decades. I, I do think there's there's a ways to go. Um, I think I think you know aspirations for peace falls down in 2023. 20, that goal has come and gone. Um, I I would suggest <laughs> sort of success rate on that hasn't been very high in terms yeah. of any movement right. there, and the fact that, that many people who live, live around peace balls don't want that no. to change, and, and you know, possibly in the future, all those kind of... Sort of institutionalized. Yeah. yeah, so I think there still remains a, yeah. a great deep level of distrust, um, and, and we can still live in our little silos and bubbles pretty easily. Yeah. You know, we have to work to kind of cross our divides. So I, I think there's still work to be done. I, I'm optimistic that it can be done, but I think there's work to be done. Belfast is the third safest city in the UK, according to the PSNI Stats Department. Certainly safer than, safer than a lot of Florida, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a couple of questions. Who wants to jump in? Over here. Let's give you a microphone. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, <laughs> Connor and Stephen, for arranging such a, a wonderful if kind of depressing conference. <laughs> I am very, very depressed. I thought it was inspirational, but I've only been here an <laughs> But absolutely fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask about, well, I can see the progress, obviously, um, mm. but from the kind of work that I do um, as a historian, and I became, particularly I talked about it this morning, about um, how my life was changed by meeting people um, during the Opsal Commission. And Leslie, I worked very closely with Kate Kelly, wonderful Kate Kelly, because um, I used to go with her to meet the women's groups. You know, each uh, commissioner was kind of sent doing very, and I, I went with her. Um, I have written about, I, I grew up in a mixed religion housing estate in North Belfast. Um, I remember being interviewed by William, who couldn't believe my rosy memory of it, and he said, was there not as much sectarianism then, Marianne? <laughs> um, we were living together, so, you know, we were friends. These people weren't enemies. Um, no, I, I, I worked with Kate, um, with and, and Eileen, I just wonder whether you know this group, because I'd love to meet them again, with a particularly wonderful group in North Belfast, who went on to um, um, win the Hiroshima, Hiroshima um, Peace Prize in 1994. And the reason that they, in particular, changed my life is that they had come from the same kind of community that I come from, mixed religion, working class areas, mm. and they had kept up their friendships <sighs> after those mixed religion areas became divided. And what they were saying to us was that that mem better memory of living together in mixed religion areas was going to go with them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I am very anxious about because there doesn't seem to be much development, maybe through fear, as you say, um, about people trying to get back into social housing that is mixed religion. Um, yeah. Am I being too negative about this? 
but certainly their memories were the same as mine. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get, I was so impressed by them. These were women from the Ardoin and from Tigers Bay, I think, that had remained friendly. I was so impressed by them that um, not that long afterwards, I tried to get big research money <clears throat> from one of the British Research Councils to try and do a memory retrieval uh, project all over Northern Ireland of people, their age group and older, about mixed religion areas. Now, I almost got it, except for one absolutely poisonous <laughs> um, anonymous peer reviewer who said, this is all motherhood and apple pie, because I was a woman leading it. Uh, uh, people in Northern Ireland have always been sectarian and divided. So, can I leave? <laughs> No, listen, I, I want to give you a chance to have a go at peer reviewers. It's absolutely fine. Professor Elliot, thank you. Would you give it to the gentleman behind? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, th this sort of dovetails into, into that because the other great <laughs> issue, um, which was st is stated very clearly in the terms of the, the agreement, is that the, the separation of children. And my, my two little... I know a lot of you have been speaking from your heart, so please forgive or please... Uh, I'm going to just speak a little bit from my own heart around this, but the, uh, these two, two beautiful twin boys of their first years in Fermanagh, and it looked like they were going to go to a school that was separate from people from the same area, uh, but who happened to have a different religious tradition. Yes, yes. I was climbing the walls over this. My, my, wee, heart, my wee heart was broken, let alone their wee hearts. Yeah. Now, their mother solved it all by taking them to Greystones in County Wicklow, where they're, <laughs> they're in a fully integrated yeah. school. Uh, and interestingly, it's the last great Protestant town in the south, was Greystones had the biggest uh, Protestant population. for that. Now it has populations from the whole world. But the, the, edu the education yeah. one, the progress, it, I mean, th this must be moved. And I mean, I'm, my background's Catholic. Yeah. Bishops, uh, cardinal, whoever need to move on this. So integrated education was, is your point, uh, Marianne's talking about integrated housing as well. They are linked in some ways, aren't they? Integrated communities, we might say. Uh, we, we don't seem to be able to get much further on, on this integrated education, Lark, Mary, do we? Um, it really interests me, this question of shared housing, shared education. One of the first international pieces of work that we did was out in the Balkans, mm. uh, in Kosovo in Croatia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And we worked with the ex-combatants there. And one of the first things that struck me was they told us that when we were facilitating um, the trainings with them, they said, you know, we do this every 50 years. And I said, but you're only 30. How do you know that? And it turned out that they had learned their history from their grandmothers. Now, they had integrated education, mm. they had integrated workspaces, they had integrated housing. However, under the communist regime, they were not allowed to talk about their culture, their nationalism. Yes. They were not allowed to talk about the past and the history of their community and some of the things that had happened. And they learned about those things at the knee of their grandmother. And sometimes that's mythology too, isn't it? And it was met, and it was built in a romantic way. Yeah. And the message went like this: It went, um, "So you like that Serb? Never forget what they did on us. Mm -hmm. Never turn your back on them. Yeah. And if anything ever happens, you'll soon find out who's your friend and who's not your friend. Don't trust them. But and we carry that in our, you know, we we have grown up with like little uh, sort of tacit culture messages mm -hmm. like that. Now, does integrated education address that? It will address it if the hard conversations are had, if the children get the opportunity of being really integrated. Mm -hmm. And for me, the whole thing, I mean, the good news is for you about shared housing. Um, but why, why do we problematize? integrated education in the way that you're doing. See, people overseas, they look at this, and this is absolutely outrageous. You know, this, it, this sounds like the 60s in 
you know, Charlotte, North Carolina, where they're arguing about whether they can integrate the swimming pools, to other people in the rest of the world, Mary, it seems so obviously thing. It's not going to solve all your problems, no. but why do we have so many institutional barriers to doing integration in this society? Power players, power dynamics who have vested interest in keeping things the way they are. Yeah, yeah. And there's no doubt about it, part of that's the church. Because Catholic education for Catholic families mm. um, and for Catholic parishes is really... Emily. Yeah. So I, I, would, I, would, I, I work in schools. Yeah. Um, now I'm with my, my work hat on in terms of with our work in community relations at schools, we work to support um, any sector of school, whether they be integrated, mm. um, Catholic maintained, controlled, uh, Irish medium, anybody, and I suppose what we're trying to do is, is again, equip people, have those skills to be able to have the conversations, conversations because it's, it's not enough just to be in an integrated school if you don't actually talk about the issues. But I would also add to that, I think there's another big divide that kind of rolls around every you know year or two, but then never gets tackled, and that's the, the, the grammar system, that's mm. the selective system. Sure. So I think there's a level of class. See, I disagree with this fundamentally. <laughs> Integration also means integrated play, integrated space, laughter that is integrated, and growing up in the company of people who are different to yourself. You don't have to have those really deep conversations. You'll have them at some point. But you, be you, you befriend, you become one as a group. I mean, I was taken on one of these deprived children's schemes at the age of nine years old, uh, uh, stayed with a Catholic family for a summer in America. I came back and I was growing up on the Mount Vernon estate, some of the people I grew up with are still in prison. They got out during the Good Friday Agreement are back in again, um, multiple murders. And why, why is my story so different to some of them, right? I was inoculated against some of the sectarian um, stereotypes of Catholics that I grew up with because I was thinking of real embodied people. And I never sat down with them and talked to them about Catholicism. It's just these people you're talking about I know people like that, and you're wrong. I got inoculated against it. Kids can get inoculated in schools, can't they? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the argument about integrated education for me is less about the past and our, and our cultural history and all of that, and more about our future and our economics. So we have no right to sit here and talk about poverty mm -hmm. and solving the poverty problem if we're not prepared to put education under one management system and stop paying so many people at the top to run so many different systems. That's my opinion. What do you think, Pat? Show me the last one. Last one. You're trying to shut me down. This man's going to speak. <laughs> Go ahead, Pat. Just, just quickly, I mean, I, Leslie's absolutely correct. I mean, if you look at the... I can only speak from a southern perspective. Um, when Don O'Malley introduced free second-level education mm -hmm. in the Republic of Ireland in 1968, uh, it began the transformation of Irish society in terms of how it seen itself, mm. uh, how it looked outwards, and more fundamentally than that, uh, created the pathway towards a, an economic system where you were producing uh, very, very high-skilled graduates in terms of the world outside, in terms of the attraction of foreign direct investment. So you had a ready-made level of, of capital available yeah. for, for investors to come in, as Leslie says, jobs, prosperity, and things to really focus on into the future. These guys have been fabulous. Let's thank them. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that, William. Thanks to, thanks to all of you. Um, just because the, the Mac is going to close the building, we'll have our own mini Corrie stuck in overnight. So um, listen, uh, there's been so much here, and it's been a terrific range of speakers. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for listening word that was used today in participating. Uh, go well, as they say in South Africa, uh, and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.